live now. Oh yeah, I've got Frank. Absolutely. Good. Thank you, Sanjay. Welcome, welcome, Ambassador. Um, uh, we are live now. We are on stream, and we have forty-five minutes ahead of us. And this is uh, the second closing plenary. Um, welcome to the Horasis India 2020 uh, discussion. I thought uh, what we would look at in this session, since this is coming to, at the end of the day, is looking ahead, looking forward. Um, we are in the middle of two very different kinds of challenges, or rather, I would say three very different kinds of challenges in India. First of all, there is the economic challenge, the slowdown in the economy over the last uh, couple of years, uh, and the problem of uh, you know decline in manufacturing growth, etc. And that's been compounded by the COVID pandemic, which has disrupted supply chains, disrupted maritime trade, disrupted internal uh, you know the economy. So the COVID pandemic has had a further debilitating impact on the economy, which was already in a slowdown. And now add to both these uh, essentially uh, internal problems for the country is a challenge that is being posed by external uh, factors, the, the standoff between India and China, uh, which is, has its own implications for uh, sentiment uh, in India, for investor sentiment, uh, for the way in which uh, you know, we look at the challenges in front of us. And since we do have Ambassador Visner with us, uh, and he's um, marked as the fourth speaker, I have already asked him to uh, focus a little more on geopolitical and, and you know, global challenges and India-US relations. But let me start with our very first speaker. Well, let me introduce you to our uh, viewers. And I don't think any one of you requires introduction uh, to uh, this uh, audience we have here. I think my computer tells me that we have over 50 people already logged into this session. I assume that will increase with time. Our um, first panelist uh, is uh, Mr. Prakash Hinduja, who is um, uh, the one of the founders of the Hinduja group and he heads the Hinduja Europe based in France. Mm -hmm. Our second speaker will be Mr. Sunil Mehta, who is presently non-executive chairman of Yes Bank and was also earlier non-executive chairman of the Punjab National Bank. Our third speaker will be Mr. Dilip Piramal, who is the Chairman and Managing Director of uh, VIP Industries, and uh, he's based in Mumbai. And of course, the fourth speaker is uh, Ambassador Frank Wisner, former Ambassador of the United States uh, to Egypt, Philippines, and of course, India, and presently with uh, Squire Pattern and Box, uh, based in the, uh, Washington. Mr. Hinduja, let me start with you. You are one of India's... Uh, most prominent business leaders um, and globally also uh, a reputed business leader. You have, in fact, over the years um, dealt with a lot of external uh, opportunities for India. I, I recall many conversations with you going all the way back to the early 90s uh, when you were uh, very optimistic about what was being done at that time. And uh, you were involved uh, in helping us uh, during the Indo-US uh, nuclear uh, deal uh, to create an uh, a even more favorable environment for India internationally. Sitting in Europe and, and heading a major business group like the Hindu Group, how do you see the post-COVID, post-pandemic global e uh, economic challenge for India, opportunities for India? Uh, how do you see us actually dealing with these challenges at the moment? And what kind of thoughts do you have for going forward? Mr. Hinduja. I'm going to mute my mic now. I request all the other speakers to mute their mics and uh, put it on. We can't hear you. Okay, now we start. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, meet with you again, Your Excellency Frank Weisner. And uh, Sanjay Baru, Dilip Piramal. And it is, uh, um, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, thank you again for having me in Horace's meeting. I much enjoyed the earlier meeting in Germany and Portugal with the COVID-19 pandemic. We are meeting virtually online the participants all over the world. I am also glad to sh uh, sharing the closing panel with such a d d distinguished speakers. Ambassador Weisner has been close friend for the family since he served as a U.S. ambassador in New Delhi. And everybody remembers him, what he has done for the U.S.-India relation. And he should be always be in the history of U.S. and India in the books, what contribution he did all this time when he was in New Delhi. I really appreciate him very much. Uh, our group, everybody knows, is a multinational Hinduja group with investment across 11 verticals in our 40 countries and 150,000 employees. Has undoubtedly been affected as the global economy has effectively Not sure. We, this is a, we're not getting any audio. Yeah, we are not getting on any audio from you, Mr. Induja. Well, let me see if he can correct it. I don't want to waste time. We just have 45 minutes. So let me bring in uh, Mr. Mehta uh, straight away. Um, uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Mehta. You'll, you'll have to unmute. You'll have to unmute your mic. Um, the icons are at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. And uh, it's a pity that we could not hear uh, Mr. Hinduja, but I will sort of stand in and say my piece and you can invite Mr. Hinduja back a little later. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure during the course of the deliberations today, much has probably been said about the Indian economy post COVID. It's quite uh, evident that we will face a serious issue uh, in the financial year 2021 and some sectors will get impacted more than the other sectors. I think the uh, as we are at, at the closing session, or at least almost at the closing session, it will probably uh, be important to spend whatever time that we have just to look at the picture in terms of a sense of optimism of sectors that we could probably look at that would sort of pull us out of this difficult situation. Um, I think the first important piece, looking at it from the hat that I wear in the banking sector, there is a huge amount of fear factor that has sort of prevailed in the entire um, economy and uh, has kind of led to a liquidity mismatch. So there is a bottle. The entire liquidity has been sort of stuck and it's so critical for us to de-bottleneck the liquidity. Uh, the What is important to see is that based on the what we have seen over the last several weeks as the lockdown has started uh, getting to be lifted, production and factories have started coming back, there has been a, a higher sense of optimism that was probably prevailing about six weeks ago as we were planning to see, as companies were planning to see as to how they would really open up and start working once again. Uh, there is a challenge in terms of maintaining the uh, alliances for dealing with the COVID situation. But I, 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 from the vantage point that I see looking across different sectors and manufacturing units, there is a steady growth of production levels. And I think that is a very, very positive sign. Some sectors have started doing better than the others. But I would still say that I think as we move into July and August, we will get to see exactly what sectors are going to perform better during the balanced part of the year. The second piece is that if we look at the uh, four or five sectors that are going to be very critical in creating a much more balanced economic growth from 21-22, the sectors that have been identified in our talk uh, as healthcare, education, digitization, and smart cities are obviously four very important ones. I'll start with healthcare. I'm quite sure there are people who are better equipped than me to talk about what needs to be done in terms of spending more on our healthcare infrastructure. There's no question that that will be required to be done. 
uh, public private participation is critical. However, I will look at it from a people's perspective. Uh, to create sustainable healthcare, we need a very large uh, insurance system, which provides participation of the people in in what would be a universal health insurance. And also, we have to be prepared as to what could be the impact of pandemics or disasters in the future. For many of the people who may be sitting in this audience or participating in this talk, uh, they will remember that several years ago, uh, in the insurance industry, we had come up with what was called the terrorism pool. That pool came in very handy when the 2611 happened and all the uh, people who got affected or businesses that got affected, including the, the two major hotels in Mumbai, used that terrorism pool that was being built over a period of time and, and sort of really got back into business, including loss of profits. It is very important for us to see as to how we can create a, a pandemic or a disaster pool in the insurance industry Climate so that Modi, that yes. would be relevant and available when we need to deal with a disaster of this size. This means that we need to accumulate into that terrorism pool over a period of time so that it's large enough for it to deal with man-made or natural disasters of the kind that we are sort of witnessing today. I leave this thought with you in terms of an added uh, benefit that could happen as far as creating our health infrastructure, not just incrementally for looking at what can be done out of telemedicine and, you know, what was earlier about health tourism um, and um, funds coming in from the banking industry to create the infrastructure, but this is people's participation in creating a better health uh, uh, infrastructure for the country. The digitalization, I'm going to sort of focus a lot on that because that is a significant asset that has been built and not spoken about for a considerable amount of time, uh, uh, particularly as we can see how the aggregation of data can be done for the development of the industry. Uh, 2014-15, uh, the banks embarked on what was called the Jandhan Yojana. And over a period of time, about 400 million new accounts, and I'm sure the number is much higher than that, that were built, that were sort of uh, came into the formal banking system. I think the, and with whatever has been aggregated post that, that number of our, the way we can reach out to the bottom of the pyramid, economically disadvantaged, is a, a, a great asset for us. We have not mined it effectively. We have not sort of done what is called the big data and the data analytics of how we can effectively deliver, which is the in micro lending, the aspect of providing them micro insurance, basically taking care of lives, livelihood, and productive assets as far as that uh, bottom of the pyramid is concerned. Uh, the direct benefits transfer that has happened is obviously going to create much more jobs. We have seen how useful Narega has been at this point of time. So if we use our data and digitalization far more effectively, I think... Mr. Mehta, I will uh, come back to you. Um, follow up some questions, particularly on... Your network is banking, not, is not stable. Uh, yeah, particularly on banking, etc. There are some questions. I'll come back to you in the second yeah. round. I have Mr. Hinduja back on stream. Uh, Mr. Hinduja, can you hear me? Mr. Hinduja? Mute, laga ke mute. Prakash ji? Prakash ji, can you hear me now? No. Please have a lot of cash. Uh, so, we go on to, to uh, Mr. Bennett, on safe yeah, transactions in the state or other. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. One word that Mr. Mehta used was fear. It's not an insurance. In a lot of conversations about the Perfect economy lending. and where we are going, the uncertainty. A businessman like you are used to dealing with what we call risk. But what the uh, COVID world has created is not uh, just risk, but uncertainty. How do you see the business? Right, so actually the insurance rules focus on lending against 
I mean, you mean a bomb? Sorry, there are a lot of voices sure. coming in. I can hear your yeah. question. And even now, there is a lot of. There are two or three voices coming in. Yeah. In time. Can I request others to mute themselves? I request this no, others to mute themselves and unmute when I will now to Okay, perfect. So, 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 can you mute yourself? Oh, I am speaking, but, uh, you know, I can speak my first language. Oh, okay, so, so, uh, okay, go ahead, Mr. Krabha. Will you repeat your question, please? I couldn't. I, 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 I was saying that, you know, Mr. Mehta used the word fear. Um, okay. so, so, is, is, is the, is the Swiss Federal Credit Assurance. Yes, yes. But, is uncertainty. So, so, so they are happened. looking Again, there is for somebody who will then right. again serve. Okay. I think okay. we're giving okay. instructions so, to Mr. Uh, I, I take it that uh, we get a, have a, uh, I a, a copy of this. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Mike, I'll also organize a copy. To, uh, you, you, it. Can we organize it? Cut off Prakash Hinduja's mic, please. Yeah, yeah no, I think they are, they've muted it now. I okay. think. So my question to you In was, the businessmen are used to dealing with risk, you but mean, not uncertainty. Uh, uh, I think think every time you start your question, the voices come back. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Ah, this is okay. All right, go ahead. I'm not going to repeat. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear your question at all. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So my question to you is that businessmen like you are used to dealing with risk, but what we find today in the post-COVID situation is uncertainty, which is a completely new game. Uh, how do you see Indian business dealing with uncertainty? And what are the kind of challenges uncertainty poses as opposed to risk? Well, it depends on uh, the business you are in. Like I am in the luggage business, which is related to travel. So uh, like airlines and hotels. And my business is absolutely stopped. I mean, there is uh, April to June is my largest quarter. And we were really looking forward to some bumper sales. We had made a lot of preparations. And the stocks which we had at the end of March, I think, are now going to last us till the end of March next year. Because as of now, in this quarter, April, May, June, we would have not even, we will be doing 5% of our sales, virtually nothing. So it depends on what business you are in. Fortunately, like I'm just talking about my individual company, and that applies to so many other companies, is that we are fairly liquid and we are, our balance sheet is very strong. So we can sustain these losses. And there is absolutely nothing we can do because uh, even worldwide, we thought we can become international. There is a good, there might be demand, but internationally also, it is the same thing with travel. And so many companies are going to go bankrupt like airlines and all. They already, many governments have come to like Germany. I heard Germany, Australia, that the government is bailing out the major airlines. And all the many businesses will absolutely go down under. It depends on what businesses you are in, what business you are in, like pharmaceuticals and so many other businesses will boom also. And in fact, I think the U.S. stock market is at an all-time high. There are many companies which are uh, their sh sh stock prices are at an all-time high. So this is an absolutely unprecedented uh, situation, and most companies have to manage their liquidity. First, they have to survive. It's a matter of survival for a lot of companies. And same thing for the smaller companies, smaller business, you know, the MSMEs and all, like shops. And uh, the retail business is very, uh, it's fairly uh, capital, inten capital intensive in compared to their, or ex their expenses are quite high where they have rentals. And if they lose sales for three or four months, then they virtually become bankrupt. So it's going to be an unprecedented problem. And I, I, the worst thing is to be in government today. It is such a double whammy that everybody wants money. You have to give money to uh, lubricate the economy for creating liquidity. But the government's own revenues are going down. I mean, if there are no profits, where how are they going to get pro, uh, income tax or corporate tax will go down? If revenue, business revenue is low, the GST collections will go down. So it's, I mean, it's the worst nightmare one could have. And uh, you need all the best brains. I mean, today, I, as an amateur, I cannot advise the government what to do, whether it is uh, uh, how to revive or come out of the COVID problem. And we are somewhere, I think in India, we are uh, nowhere have, has the curve flattened. We are still, 
it's still a little bit higher. I was just seeing the Mumbai figures today, and maybe we are flattened for two, three days. But one doesn't know what will happen once the lockdown uh, opens up. Then I'm sure the infections will increase. And but there is no other way out. Also, so it is a dilemma. I mean, it's it's a nightmare. I wouldn't wish any buddy upon. Well, I'll I'll come back to you and persist with my question that how do you, you know the situation you have described very well, but how do we deal with this? I mean, how do you see other businessmen? I assume you are in conversation with many colleagues. How do you see them dealing with this? I'll come back. I, to I you. can answer this right now if you like. Uh, oh. Okay. Like, uh, see, a lot of businessmen in the FMCG, the consumer goods, they are not so badly affected. And in fact, some of them, uh, their businesses will even go up, you know, like the soaps and the disinfectants, etc. Companies like Godrej and all, because they, they, the demand for their products will go up. Food companies are doing pretty well. Uh, it's the capital goods sector is very very badly affected because that is always capital goods are like a feast or famine uh, business. When the going is good, the, their uh, investments are more. When the going is bad, the first thing which is affected is the capital sector. So nobody wants to invest in new capital expenditure. People want to postpone it. They'll only do whatever is essential. So that sector. It depends on what sector you are. So many farm. The rural economy is not so badly off. And there are many products which are now consumer products also, where the rural sector is a large uh, market. Okay. So they are doing okay. And uh, basically, the travel industry is going to be very badly affected. The tra travel includes mainly the transport is the biggest sector in that. Then the hotels are very badly affected. Luggage is probably not even one percent of the travel industry. So we are going to be very badly off. Okay. Uh, well, before I move on to Mr. Uh, Ambassador Visna, because we're going to talk about certain um, geopolitical and global issues, let me see if I can get Mr. Hinduja back because we had lost him. Uh, Mr. Hinduja, can you hear me now? Can you can you hear me? Um, are you able to rejoin the conversation? No, I think we'll be satisfied by looking yeah, at, yeah, you, at can me, you can hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Come back. No. France, I think France mm -hmm. needs more Indian IT well, uh, support. <laughs> well, then let me move on to uh, Ambassador Visna. Ambassador mm -hmm. Visna, as I said at the very beginning, I mean, we are in the middle of multiple uh, challenges. There is the underlying challenge of the Indian economy slowing down. There is the uh, completely new uh, challenge of the pandemic and the uncertainty created by pandemic. But we also are in a world of, uh, you know, tremendous change uh, with the... Um, growing contention between the United States and China, right. and now China put exerting pressure on, on India. Uh, from your vantage point, how do you see uh, you know, these uh, geopolitical challenges being tackled in a post-COVID context? I mean, the COVID sets the economic context for the world economy, uh, but there are all these geopolitical challenges which are not going away. Your, your mic, uh, Frank, Frank, your mic, you're to unmute. I am trying to do that. Yeah, that's done. That's done. Is it now done? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. I hear you. I can hear you. No, we can't hear you now. No, no, no. You, you. You, you have to press the unmute button and make sure it's unmuted. No, we can't hear you. No. You you see the icon on your bottom left? It says the speaker icon. Just unmute that. I've done. Yeah. How now you're okay. Now, How are we? And now you're okay. Now you're okay. <laughs> Technology is. The master of us all. Uh, so I was attempting to say thank you very much for including me. And I particularly regret not being able 
to hear more of uh, BP Hinduja because he was saying such nice things about me. But <laughs> welcome back to the conversation. Um, Sanjaya, you put your finger on the, a critical dimension of the path forward, whether it's for India or for the United States. I actually believe at heart what is taking place today and will, as we work our way through the pandemic, is a series of trends on the global stage that were already present before the pandemic and have simply been accelerated by it. Um, but I come back to the core point I want to make, and that is, however we look to the future, India's future, and indeed America's future, our relationship, the one between the United States and India, is going to be an enormously important factor. <clears throat> For India, as you try to come out of your economic difficulties, and as you face the very strategic challenges that you, Sanjaya, just referenced. Uh, my starting point is a simple argument, and that is the relationship between the United States and India today is based on a convergence of national interest, and that has persisted now for nearly 30 years. On, on the other hand, we have to be careful and recognize that despite the convergence, our relationship still is an uneven one and needs to be managed very, very carefully. As I look forward and situate India and the United States, I really take, I really start with the important observation that our relationship depends on our joint perceptions of what's before us. And that requires very close consultations. The China factor is particularly important. And I believe, despite China and the pressures China is bringing to bear on the international system and on India and with the United States, that our relationship will be a key factor in managing that challenge. But I'm prepared to say as well that we and you have to be very careful with each other, for there are differences. And let me mention four that are important. The first is as you Indians look at we Americans, remember, we're a very tough, bad ally. We tend to be very demanding, and India likes to maintain her strategic autonomy and will not be an American cat's paw. So that will always pose a difficulty. Second, India will maintain relationships at variance with the way the United States sees the world. It's re India's relationship with Russia is a classic example. Then there are going to be divergences. And unfortunately, at the moment, they're growing in the field of trade and economics. We have a persistent number of trade disputes, and we're adding new ones with 301 <coughs> findings on digital taxation. All of these put pressure on the trade relationship and complicate the official ability of our two governments to sort them out. Finally, I would point to the factor that I believe, Mr. Paramo, you, you mentioned, and that is that the rising issue of Hindutva in Indian politics is having, for the first time, an effect on India's image in this country, particularly in Congress and particularly on the left wing of the Democratic Party. So far, the Indian-American relationship has been strongly bipartisan. For the first time, I've seen some cracks in it. So I believe, nonetheless, despite these reservations, they're really signals of caution rather than reservations. Remember, we need to proceed carefully. But I believe our relationship will survive the turbulence of the Trump period. I believe that the Chinese-Indian um, issues will themselves be enormously binding and require us to work very closely together. I worry in the short term that the COVID crisis, together with the economic downturn in India, 
is weak and durability distracted government from building your military intelligence diplomatic strengths and reinforcing Indian influence outside of your borders. That's been weakened by this current period, but you will return. And so Sanjaya, to wrap up, let me quickly say that I am a great optimist about the relationship and what it can do for both of us. We need each other to maintain the balance of power, particularly in Asia, and particularly in the face of China's pressure to create a hierarchical outcome of which China sits at the pinnacle and dictates relations to her neighbors. But I believe our relationship must be pursued cautiously, with patience. We have to continue to work on the sinews of it, our military to military uh, <clears throat> relationship, our technology exchanges, our trade differences, which are maddening but need to be overcome. And then if those issues can continue to be managed sensibly, be careful for they are dangerous, then I believe the security and economic interests of India will be well served and the relationship will be a key contributor to it. Thank you, Frank, for a very comprehensive kind of assessment of uh, the situation today. I think Mr. Hinduja is back with us, so let me see if I can go back to him. Um, Mr. Hinduja? Prakash ji? Yes, I, I had mentioned that uh, Eric, the recent tension of the line of control the Prime Minister has his hands full. I recommend that the Indian government moves in the May for 270 billion stimulus package to boost the country's better economy. Sadly, as we know, this is just a start. Prime Minister Modi has identified five key pillars in future economics roadmap, including economy, infrastructure, demography, democracy, and supply chains. Successful integration and relation of these factors will be crucial to achieve the quantum of jump in our overall growth and development. Policy recommendation, we are planning to do that. To address the incoming reception, the Indian government should consider the following options. Reduce corporation tax to incentive future investments and attract foreign investments. Removal of the dividend distribution tax to encourage the private investment. Simplify personal income tax regime and higher investment in infrastructure and roads of irrigation and transport. Let me conclude with some suggested further measures to stimulate the growth of the government to consider is includes private sector participations in a digit sector, including coal, mineral, defense production, civil aviation, infrastructure, space, autom atomic energy is welcome and will boost the economy further. Pri privatization of the state-owned enterprise assets to provide funding for government, spending encourage saving by households with tax cuts, provide incentive for manufacturing firms to invest such a saving, substitute imports and increase the country's global market share of exports. India has ample foreign exchange reserves and the low level of the short-term foreign debt. The, out, the current sharp fall in oil price works in India's favorable is US $10 drops include the price helps the country's current account around US 13 billion uh, balanced by roughly US dollar 13 billion. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will just convey a message to Frank Weisner. If a strategy can be made to help the yeah, and they three of them, if they come to some understanding and India plays an important role in bringing US and China on the table, I'm sure that the world will admire this and this will be a great contribution of these three countries. And they should think about the world's economy and to the world problem which is going on with coronavirus. India with coronavirus, they have done a fantastic job, I can tell you. With the population what we have compared to the other part of the world, we can still do better 
there a proper discipline, a proper plan, as the Japan has done and many countries have done, to provide all the necessary facilities to the people and advise them how they should do. When you drive a car, you come to a red signal, you stop it. There is a discipline there. So in the coronavirus also, you should make a plan that people coming out of the house should always wear a mask. Once this is done, I'm sure India will far ahead of this. And the doctors are doing a great job over here as we have a Hinduja hospital. We are playing a and other places. I wish you all the best to all the speakers who have contributed for Mr. Richter, Horace's group, who, who is doing a great thing every year. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. You. Sanjay Baru, thank you. Thank you, Prakashi. Thank you. Suriel, I'm going to come back to you. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about risk I'm and uncertainty. And um, Suriel, can you hear me? I can hear you, Sanjay. Yeah, so you are in the financial sector. I mean, the question really is, how do you bring, um, you know, confidence back into the financial sector? Banks have money, they're not lending. Mr. Hinduja talked about a whole lot of policies that governments can take up, but many of them are supply side, incentivizing, uh, you know, spending. But where is the demand? And how, how do you see the financial sector, you know, uh, investing back and lending money and, Encouraging spending. So, you know, uh, Sanjay, we are no doubt we are coming from uh, a complex situation where there were headwinds in the economy prior to the COVID and COVID added another overlay. And uh, the last 90 odd days, uh, there is from a stress testing of a risk portfolio of the banks, uh, the COVID situation has added one more complexity in terms of different sectors. How much do you stress test to see what could be the maximum downside? And if you infuse more liquidity, is that liquidity also going to get stuck there or is it going to move out into the entire stream? So, you know, it's it's a easy rhetoric in the system that the bankers are not lending. Sitting on the seat on the other side, we are protecting, actually, our fidu uh, discharging our fiduciary responsibility to the depositors by making sure that we do not do reckless lending at this point of time. Our first responsibility is to the SME and the MSME sector. The government has provided the support, and there is a much more infusion that is taking place at that in that sector. I am very sure that as we sort of progressively move down that chain, this will provide the kind of support and the confidence because the SME sector has to come back. Our jobs are dependent on that sector. Second piece is that we've got to do the segmentation of which companies or corporates or industries are going to get affected. We need to either decide that we can carry on with the same uh, promoters who may or may not have the liquidity or we need to have funds who will come in they, there will be a reconfiguration of portfolios. And the more we allow that to happen, whether you call it the bad bank or you call it stress asset funds or AIF, I think that is going to be the order of the day so that there is no funding that is available. The banks will take a hit. There's no question about it. But the important thing is that while this is happening, many of the banks are also recapitalizing themselves to be prepared as to whatever happens post COVID, the moratorium, when the moratorium finishes, we will actually see what the real situation is. Uh, and I think by last quarter of this calendar year and first quarter of the next calendar year, we'll get to see the real situation. But you know, it's not all negative news. I think we've got to prepare ourselves for how we're moving ahead. And I still want to say that the most important thing is how we can organize ourselves is by using data. Those techniques of using data in terms of how the money flows are taking place, which MSME sector, which we sort of will eventually sort of come out of it and which we may have to write off. Unless you use big data and data analytics and understand that more effectively, that's an issue. The last also one more aspect is the infrastructure financing. The there has been a slowdown. That means many of the, the liquidity has been stuck 
in many different places, including the government. So we'll need to allow that deep bottlenecking of the liquidity so that it flows into the system. And that's how the confidence will come back for all those sectors. I do not say it is completely gloom and doom. We see positivity that is taking place. And I'm obviously hopeful, but we also have to be prepared for the worst. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, I'm afraid because of certain technical glitches, we have uh, not had all the time we would have liked to for a continued conversation. And I am being warned on my laptop that our time is coming to an end. Uh, the ca- takeaway from this session I see is that we are in uncertain waters. We are in uncharted waters across many fronts on the economic front, on the healthcare front, on the geopolitical front. And it is really a great uh, opportunity for India as much as it is a challenge for India. How the country's leadership, the business leadership, the political leadership uh, steps uh, to the to the uh, tasks, steps forward and takes the forward uh, can really make a huge difference. I mean, it's not often that leadership can make a difference to a huge country like India because there are so many underlying factors uh, that shape uh, the, the dynamics of our economy, the dynamics of our polity, that individuals uh, don't always have the opportunity to make a difference. But we have seen situations in the past. I mean, 1991 is a good example of a complex situation in which individuals made a difference. We've had other uh, situations where individual leadership, or whether in the corporate sector or in the political uh, government sector, made a difference to the outcome. And I actually do believe that we are now at that point where leadership makes a huge difference. And corporate leadership particularly can make a lot of difference. Uh, some of the ideas that, that come up in this session suggest that you know, apart from looking to government for solutions, uh, using data, using technology, using the uh, new opportunities, using uh, new possibilities, uh, Indian business can diversify, can look at uh, new new green at green pastures. And the same applies for uh, the uh, global context, as Mr. Wisner correctly said, that, uh, you know, there are a lot of constraints uh, that India faces internationally in its relations with various great powers uh, and in its relations with its own neighbors. But these are all challenges that also have, uh, on the other side, opportunities. I'll end with saying that, um, you know, over the last 20 years, we were looking at the, uh, the argument was that India is a rising economy, a rising power. Uh, we are at a cusp where questions are being asked whether this rise is being thwarted uh, by nature, by COVID, by policy, uh, by uh, global competition. And I think what we do in the next six months to one year is critical uh, for the future. I see that as the takeaway uh, from all your interventions. I hope I am not uh, misrepresenting the kind of uh, uh, thinking in the group. Let me thank you, uh, gentlemen, for, for sparing this time. And let me thank uh, fr- uh, our friend, Mr. Richter, for bringing us all together uh, in a, what has been a fairly, uh, you know, fairly stimulating conversation. And once again, sorry for all the technical glitches. I think the French need more Indian software engineers and IT technicians. Like the, very, like the United States has. So, Mr. Hinduja, tell the French to get a few more Indians there and, and they will improve your IT connectivity. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing all of you in, in real life and not just in this virtual space. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.